I am within my rights to give a quick history lesson. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. Come on, George 100%. Franklin. Labor Day. Labor Day is about labor, though. Right. Not quite. Not quite. So, Labor Day became a federal holiday in 1894. It's like one of the most boring like uh, history periods to study, in my opinion. I had like, a really hard time focusing on those guys. But uh, the, the, the concept of Labor Day and this like celebration of laborers, of workers, of the working class, started in 1882. So about 12 years before that, there was a labor union in New York. Um, they convinced their members to go on a strike right just for a day which is already kind of odd typically you know when workers go on strikes is because there's a goal that they're trying to reach yeah. but this was going to be just a one day long strike yeah. right and what the labor union did there in new york for the laborers those that chose to take the uh, unpaid time off to strike for the day was it turned into more of a party is they, they had like a picnic, they had fireworks, they did a bunch of cool stuff for the laborers. And they had a parade and all this, instead of marching, they turned it into a parade and it was really a celebration, right? This caught traction and before it actually became a federally recognized holiday by President uh, Cleveland Weaver or something like that, um, they had half the states, half of the states in the union were practicing this day where all the laborers just took the day off and they just had this celebration. And there's kind of a funny story from the uh, uh, the year that it became a federal holiday. So this is the last time that laborers didn't all universally have the day off was in 1894. And uh, there was a, what was it called? Yeah, it was Grover Cleveland. But there was a rail car manufacturing plant in Chicago, right? And what the owner did was he cut their wages. And this was really strange. And we can just kind of like compare the world we live in today to in 1894. The owner of that plant owned this small town where all of his workers lived. So they paid rent to him. So he cut their wages and he didn't lower their rent. <laughs> this was the last year, right? Um, before, but uh, so they this this is when Chicago, essentially Illinois, joins the, uh, the the group of laborers that would strike. But really, it was a, a day where that they took to celebrate themselves and their hard work, yeah. right? Because during that time period. Um, manufacturing plant employees worked 100 to 102 hours a week that was if you worked in like manufacturing right which was what most of america was during that time <clears throat> if you uh did like a more broad average it was like 61 hours a week that was a more broad average when you took into consideration like the owners and kind of the more like a uh, People were like up, uh, upper echelon, but that was America. Yeah. Was the, that was the working class? That's what people did. That's that's you and I. If you and I lived in like the late eighteen hundreds, that that that's life. So, what is Labor Day? Labor Day is really it's a celebration of. Uh, almost like a, a fairly like dark history yeah. of like man like we get to actually live now <laughs> yeah. right like so the title of our lesson is going to be christian work, mm -hmm. christian work. I, I did some some researching because i was in a researching mood um i had my history hat on so in islam in islam they pray 75 minutes a day a day right every year during Ramadan they fast from sun up to sundown for 30 days straight 30 days of sun up to sundown fasts right 
Uh, they have to perform, perform at least one pilgrimage to Mecca is required. And this one's kind of mid. 2.5% of all of their earnings and savings, they have to donate, right? Um, and no alcohol whatsoever. Not a drop. Or pork. A lot of other things, too. Uh, Judaism, uh, I learned that this is actually true, uh, is animal sacrifices every day. Back when the temple existed. Uh, every day. Every day. Every family had a, a private sacrifice once a year. We, we, we all knew about that one. Um, the daily one was kind of surprising to me. Um, and we know uh, Luis's uh, uh, passage that, he, that him and Vani chose was really awesome was everyone it, that was giving their gifts. So you know that the, giving a gift to a temple was a tithe, yeah. right? Um, so that was the system in Judaism was 10% of all of your wealth, right? Every year. And check this out, 16 holidays. That's more than one a month. Sabbath requirements, um, six religious fasts a year. This is the cool one though, look, Christianity. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That he died on the cross for your sins. He resurrected on the third day and go to church when you feel like it. Is the laziest world religion that exists is Christianity. I was like running out of time and I just figured it would depress myself if I went and did one for like Buddhism and Hinduism and stuff like that. Wow. Is if you're like to like ask Google or, or just to like, I don't know, use like just to ob for your observation, Christianity is the laziest religion in the world. But that's purely off of observation. But if you actually look in the Bible, I'm going to just quote off a couple Proverbs. Proverbs 13, 4, a sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. Diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in forced labor. Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. Proverbs 6.6, 6, go to the ant, you sluggard, and consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Proverbs 18.9, this one's nice. One who is slack in his work is brother to one who destroys. It's like, it, it kind of makes uh, Jesus look a little tame there in John 8 when he tells everyone that their father is Satan. He's like, no. Lazy people are brothers to Satan. John five seventeen. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day and I too am working. We can all turn for this one because I like this one. We'll go to Ephesians 2. And this is where we'll start talking about Christian work. Because isn't that super interesting that work has become a trigger word? It just challenges the very theology of American Christianity. The word work. The entire Bible is built on the premise of work. God himself is working. It says in verse 10, it says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Work is supposed to be in our DNA. Not like our, our physical, like biological DNA, although that's true too if you look at Genesis 2, right? That's the, the curse of mankind is to work. So it's in our biological DNA, but even on top of that, the whole idea and, and, and really the, the, the truth and the fact of us being new creations 
is we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And this is my favorite part. It says, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's just amazing to think about that God, wait, 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 before time existed, knew you. We already know that's true because of Acts 17 and stuff like that. We looked at that on Wednesday for the Seeking God study. Yeah. But way back then, it says he prepared work for you to do individually before your time was up. And that was your purpose in Christ. It's in, it's in your soul. It, it had to be there. The work that God prepared for you and I to do is, is it's somewhere in your soul. So Christianity, discipleship, it was never meant to become this lazy philosophy. Yeah. Ever. Amen. You know, and learning about Labor Day, which is funny because I probably have learned about that a million times just given what I studied in school. I just never really paid attention to it because I thought it was boring. <laughs> but it, uh, it, it did it. It made me think about when I moved to San Francisco for college. Um, I, uh, I, I remember my, uh, the, the fall semester when I just moved to San Francisco. I uh, picked a flyer off of this bulletin board and it was like an invite to a Bible study. It was an invite to a Bible study, had like a phone number on it. it. I don't even know, remember what ministry it was to, but I was like, oh, like that's, that's, that's a really good idea. I should do that. <laughs> put the, I put it in my wallet, and that, that stayed in my wallet for like a year, oh, and I didn't do anything with it. I never went to it or anything, but I, I remember, um, <laughs> I think like it's probably like a main function of struggling is it just makes you think. Struggling just makes you think, yeah. you know? I was just doing terrible. I was two years into college because I did a college, I did a year of college at a, at a JC. And then I moved to San Francisco and um, most of you know the story. I was met in April of uh, my, of the spring semester, obviously. Um, so I'm like 80, 90% of the way done with my second year of school. And I'm like, this is going bad. <laughs> like, this is not the way college is supposed to go, yeah. man. Like, first two years, like, that's supposed to be half of your college career. And I've, like, blown both of them. Mm. Like, this is not good. And I remember I had this pressing question. And this is how you know that God has set eternity on the hearts of all men. This is my question is, what does God want from me? Like, like seriously, like, as a human being, just trying to do his best, what does God expect from me? Yeah. And I was like, it, it can't be much because I'm just me and I'm not doing well. <laughs> right? Shame. But like, actually, what is it? There has to be an answer. Right? And I don't think I've ever been more disappointed by an answer to a question like that before ever. I was just being honest. I was so disappointed when I got the answer to this question. Mark chapter 1. I was thinking about that this morning. I was like, okay, what is Christian work? And it took me back to that time in my life when I had that question. And then I remember and I was like, oh, yeah, I remember when I learned the answer to this question. I remember like it was yesterday. Verse 14 says, after John was put in prison... Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone down a little further, he saw James and of Zebedee and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So, I uh, actually, I googled how difficult of a job it was to uh, be a fisherman in the first century. It's worse than you think. It's worse than you think. 
Um, so actually, their nets, and not even the chosen, does the does it really accurate, or or justice, I should say. Their nets were made out of linen. Oh. And what they would do is they would drag these linen nets across the lake or a sea, right? And it said that it, they they had to like especially wash these nets and clean them properly. Otherwise, it'd just get super nasty and they'd rot real fast. And now your net's toast. And you gotta get a new net, right? And what they would do is they had to hand drill holes in rocks so that they could attach them as weights for their net, right? Because you gotta have a net, you wanna fish, you need fishing weights. Yeah. Is they'd have to hand drill these holes into these rocks. Yeah. And the hours were typ typically a working day for them was throughout the night. Was an overnight shift automatically, Goodness. right? And some of us remember the passage where Jesus tells them to go into the deep waters and put yeah. cast out their net. Yeah. And they said, "Dude, we've been working all night and caught nothing." Right? And that's the whole story with the miraculous catch. Is it was hard work to be a fisherman in the first century. And how does Jesus call his first? How 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 does he define? How does he choose to define Christianity? with his first followers, his first disciples, was fishing for men. Yeah. Obviously, I didn't, you know, understand the insights of first century fishing when the brothers explained this passage to me, yeah. but I was still, like, thoroughly disappointed. I was like, that's terrible. That sucks. Because <laughs> I just knew, I was like, this is the answer to my question that I had. Yeah. Yeah. Is this is what God wants from me? Come on, bro. It was, I was, it was so underwhelming. I was like, oh my gosh. The first thing that came to mind was like street preachers and like door knockers. And I'm like, dog, this is not fun. Like, come on, man. Like, I've already had a really bad last two years. And I was like really hoping that like this Bible study thing was going to change all that. And I was like, man. All right, we, we got to do what we got to do, you know? Obviously now we're we're missionaries in Wyoming, so that's yeah. that's yeah. crazy. So it, it it worked crazy enough. Let's go over here though to Second Corinthians five, and we'll expand on this because obviously all of us here we're all very familiar with Mark one and the passage and fishing for men. That's what it means to be a disciple, and that's what God wants for yeah. us. Second Corinthians five. Come on, Nick twelve. I am gonna read it in the NLT. Yes. I did say chapter 5, right? Yeah. Chapter 5, verse 11. It says, Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No, we're giving you a reason to be proud of us. So you can answer those who brag about having spectacular a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. If it seems we're crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we're in our right minds, it is to your, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. The whole passage, obviously, is amazing. But what stood out to me, because we're talking about Christian work, we're talking about Labor Day, it says, we work hard to, per to persuade others. Come on, bro. It's interesting right now because there's a lot of, uh, especially like on Facebook and you know, just a lot of like persecution coming out against the church. And uh, there's a ton. It's like a really good time to just like take a break from Facebook. Um, if you're into taking breaks, I'm not really into taking breaks from social media, I don't think really. Um, especially not Facebook. I'm like, I just like to see what's going on with the kingdom and whatever. And um, I don't mind the persecution like that really. Um, but it's just, it, 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 the thing that bothers me the most 
is that whatever it is that people have against like leadership, you know what yeah. I mean, and like 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 church politics, like when you actually like think about like what what we're really trying to do as God's church, as God's movement, like mission teams like this and what special missions actually does. Right, people love to ignore what special missions actually does. We all relocated here for like actually really cheap, is we weren't very expensive people to move. Right, but until Jesus comes back and the world ends, there will be a church in Laramie, Wyoming, because of what we did. Come on. Right. And what the church is actually trying to do. Is we're just trying to convert people. We're just trying to persuade true. others. Yeah. That's true. it. Yeah. And people love to focus on people they don't even know. Mm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, I don't know. They could be bad. I don't know them. Right. And neither do you. Right. Yeah. And you're so convinced mm. that you know everything that's going on Ooh. in these situations. So convinced. Oh, no. Oh, no. There's no way you could possibly be wrong about this person that you don't know. Amen. On the other side of the world. <laughs> like it's ridiculous. And I, I think there's an interesting culture amongst the, the faithful yeah. disciples in the movement. Um, there's obviously there, there's ministries who don't do well, right? There's ministries who do really well, right? And it's this culture of just excitement mm. around meeting somebody, studying the Bible with them, and baptizing them. Yeah. It's an awesome culture. Yeah. Beautiful. But there's a catch to it. There's a catch to it, because what that does, what that does, is a, a a church or a ministry that's like, is like not active. There's like no activity going on in it. Yeah. Is is being unsuccessful? Is struggling? Is is not being fruitful? Yeah. It's really weird. Yeah. It gets weird. Yeah. Right. It's it's a product of the culture. It, it's culture is beautiful culture. I'm not against it, obviously. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. <laughs> fishing for men. I just read Mark 1. Hallelujah. You know, 14 to 20, so. But, things get weird amongst disciples when the ministry's not moving, when people aren't getting baptized. And this yeah. obviously has been way too long since we've had a baptism in our church. Yeah. yeah. So it gets a little weird. Right? But this is what I think has to counteract, has to counteract the weirdness is we have to think of the big picture again. We, we can never forget what yeah. fishing for men actually means. Yeah, come on, man. What working hard mm. to persuade yeah. others of this new life that we have in Christ that Second Corinthians 5 is talking about is big picture. Yeah, come on. Is it, it always gets me super excited when I just think about the amount of people that I'm going to convert in my lifetime. Mm. Have you ever thought of that? How many people in your lifetime that you're going to convert? That should be a big number. Yeah. That should put a smile on your face, like immediately. It should immediately remind you of what your purpose is. Come on, Nick. And what the Christian work is really about. Yeah, come on, Nick. Let's go, though. I think of, uh, uh, yesterday was really funny. So my parents obviously were in town. And uh, there was this, like, artisan street fair going on in uh, uh, Fort Collins. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, it's like a big farmer's market, basically. Um, but we're, like, walking down, like, the main street where we've all, like, gone for birthday dinners and stuff like that, you know? Oh, yeah. And uh, you, who do we run into is we ran into Andrew and Kennedy. Oh, wow. They were down there. Um, I caught Andrew, like, stuff in his face with his hand, which like, <laughs> like, oh, hey, you know? It was super funny. But it got to introduce them to my parents and stuff like that, and it was really cool. Um, and uh, I, I, I talk to my parents all the time, and I told them, you know, like, oh, yeah, we, like, we converted this awesome married couple. You know, one of them's been in, like, Cambodia for a year doing an internship and, you know, was in London for two years and stuff like that. And um, so they got to kind of put a, faces to, to the names that, that we told them. I, I just think about like man the first guy that I baptized with Andrew that's gonna be fun yeah. 
That's gonna be super cool. You know, um, I think of uh, I think of Blake. Like, I I and whenever I think of Blake, I remember him being inebriated at our at his seeking God study. Oh. I love to uh, I love to throw him under the bus for that one. I remember showing up to Blake seeking God study that Nazim was leading. Nazim was leading Blake seeking God study while Blake was under the influence. So that was hilarious. That was that was really funny. Nazim knew. Nazim knew. He looked more than I did. That's not true. You don't even remember. Um, but and now we're here, right? I, uh, I I think of Luis. I think of uh, I think of trying to get him into a Bible study for like two years. This guy would always come to Devo, looking all cool and suave, whatever, with his Yeezys and stuff like that. He's back from you know co he's college boy. He goes to UC, right? Uh, just trying to hang out with his brother and stuff. And we're always going to bar and him trying to get him into a Bible study. And I remember. Finally studying the Bible with this kid and baptizing him it was fun. It was super awesome. Um, I think of AJ. I didn't baptize AJ, <laughs> but uh, I do remember um, being like super annoyed with Stephen because uh, we were starting to move away. Like like we had said like five times that we were not doing Zoom anymore. Like it was hard, hard line, no more Zoom, we're, we're fully back in person. And uh, uh, I was like, I was sick. I was just tired of putting my phone on that stupid <laughs> stand and I didn't have my phone. And then I'd come back to my phone, I had like a bunch of emails and a bunch of texts and missed calls and stuff like that. And it was like super annoying, I hated it. Amen. And then uh, uh, I think I had like half a week of, so like two meetings of the body, I had a staff and um, the previous Sunday that I didn't have to do Zoom, and then Wednesday comes. Wednesday comes, and Steven is like, bro, I need, I'm, I'm sorry, I need you <laughs> to put up Zoom. I, I, you have to do it, please. Because I got this guy in Arkansas who's studying the Bible. You know, we've done, like, Word of God with him. But, bro, just trust me, he's going to become a, a disciple. Aww. It's gonna happen, but I just I, we're, we're gonna have to call him to move out of Arkansas and like like just set it up for me, please. And I'm like, Bro, you don't know what you're asking me to do, man. <laughs> I'm gonna put up that phone, and everybody is gonna see Go that to phone. Go to <laughs> Everyone's gonna gonna and they're gonna run up on me, and they're gonna ask me for the link. I'm gonna have 50 people on my phone, and I'm gonna have to go up and down, up and down, up and down, because if I don't have my phone, I can't send them the link. You know what I mean? Yeah. Gosh, we put up that link though, and AJ got baptized. So Woo! you're welcome, bro, for my my my, my Zoom room. I think my Zoom room was a vital part of, of AJ getting baptized. That's hilarious. It's like I got two phones. What's that? There's a there's a song called Two Phones, right? Yeah, yeah. Um. But I just I I love to think. I love to think. Some of us love to feel, you know. I love to think about like just all the people that God is gonna allow me to to impact. All the yeah. impact that God is gonna allow me to have in the world. And it just reminds me of how amazing Christian work is. It gets me so indignant and just frustrated by lazy Christians. Yeah. Lazy, ugly Christian th theology. <laughs> that adding work into Christianity is blasphemous, like, makes me want to yell at somebody. Mm. That it's heretical to add work into Christianity. Are you crazy? <laughs> and we have to get just so... We have to get our our, 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 our passion Come on. for Christian Come on. work and Come never on. lose it. Here, we'll, we'll, we'll start to wrap up in Philippians 2. I'm going to read the NLT again. Go ahead. Come on, let's go. NLT. But Philippians 2. The Nicholas Likes translation. Let's go, Nick. Woo. Come on, bro. This is good. 
Philippians 2 verse 14. It says, do everything without complaining and arguing. It's like lazy people love to complain and argue. Just love it. So that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a wonderful, in, in, in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life, then on that day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did, I did not run the race in vain, Whoa. and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice, even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a drink offering to God. Just like your faithful service is an offering to God, and I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice, and I will share your joy. Amen. So Paul refers to this uh, this race that he's running, like repeatedly. Other 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 letters that he wrote, this race that he's running. And I thought of it today, like just the question, like what race, dude? Like people run, you know, for fun. I don't understand it, but people run for fun. But race implies multiple parties. You have to have a competition to race. Yeah. Race is not, you can't just race yourself. What race is Paul talking about? Oh, the, the, the Christian life, the Christian race. Like, okay, that still doesn't tell us who is the race against. Are we racing each other? Yeah. Like, I thought of it. Especially this, this letter in Philippians. We know he wrote this. He's in jail in Rome. So this isn't even one of the uh, stints in jail he did that he got released from. This is Paul's last stint in jail. And he's reminded of the race again at that moment. Inspired by God and this, this race. But what race? I think he's racing time. We've heard that phrase before. It's a race against time. Yeah. yeah. What is a race against time trying to communicate? Urgency. Yeah. Is Paul was racing against time wow. his whole life. Oh and that's what his ministry was. His ministry was a race against time. Because he talks about it there in Philippians 2. He says there's going to be a day where Jesus returns. And he's racing against that. Yeah. To try and get as many people as possible. be cool for a creative type to kind of make like a bible talk name off of that concept so. race against time bible talk i don't know mm -hmm. it sounds kind of weird but i'm sure there's a spin i'm sure there's a spin I love this so much about Paul. I love this so much about this passage. And I think we have to struggle and we have to wrestle and we have to fight to keep this perspective. Yeah, come on. That, man, hey, we're just, we're just running a race against time mm. in a world full of crooked and perversity. Yeah. And it says, it's so cool in, in the passage, it says that we shine like stars in the universe. Mm -hmm as those running this race against time, which we know time is just a construct. Yeah. And it's going to run out at some point and just cease to exist, and that would be really weird because <laughs> obviously we've never existed outside of time. But outside of time, God imagined you and I, yeah. and he planned and he set work mm. for you and I to complete Come on. in time, yeah. right? It's this whole, like, paradox. It's super awesome. <laughs> But we've got to get obsessed with this this Christian work. Yeah. Yeah. That Christianity is work. Absolutely. I don't care how heretical that sounds in <laughs> 2024. It's ridiculous. Christian work is the best work. Come on. Yeah. That's, that's the point of the cross. I mean, yeah. man, like, 2 Corinthians 5. <laughs> is That is the point of the cross. Is that was Jesus' work. Right, Paul even referring to being poured out like a, like a drink offering is that's that was Jesus in the garden, just trying to do his work. Right. 
So let's think about that as we, we meditate for communion.